Coming up, the New York football giants took their fate in their hands and squeezed that precious little angel until it was dead. We dive in on the loss to the Saints, what didn't work for the defense and the offensive side, and what it means for the season remaining. All coming up next. Ah, yes, my friends, it is the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your host over here, Adam Armick, over there, Andrew Makowitz, and he is, he's healthy, wealthy, and wise. The New York Football Giants season, however, is not, as they lose in somewhat demoralizing fashion, 24 to 6 on Sunday afternoon, effectively ending that glimmer of a slimmer of a hope that we wanted ourselves and the fan base to hang on to, to be able to make the playoffs. It was a disappointing game on a lot of level, Andy. We're going to start on the offensive side of the ball, but just overall, were you were you pretty much just sipping a sipping a cocktail and saying, "Well, boys, we had a nice run." Yeah, listen, uh, uh, we came in on, on the prediction show, and uh, you had you came in with the optimistic for feeling it. for the Giants, which I went. For I it. love. Yeah, I, I went I, for it. I'm usually the one that is is brimming with optimism and you I was Joseph Gordon Levitt and Angels in the outfield you know what I mean I said no I see one I see one wait it was George, Joseph Gordon Levitt in yeah, Joseph Gordon Angels Levitt in the with outfield? Christopher Lloyd Angels in the outfield yeah one of his early starring roles come on guy my goodness it, it, you know it's been so long since I've seen <laughs> that movie that you forget who it actually is Adam so what what a reference there good you on go. pat on your back good good on you on that one uh, but listen, I, I, I kind of had a sneaking suspicion that this was the way that the game was going to go. My, the whole time leading up to this game, I, you know, we, we talked about the warts that Derek Carr had. We talked about how the Giants have the ability to win this game, how the, the Saints aren't really a great football team. But think about it. An undrafted rookie QB going into a hostile environment against a really good defense and a competent quarterback. It, it was a recipe for disaster for the Giants. You, you kind of felt the second that the Giants got behind by eight points, it was like the next team to score is really going to win this game because if the Giants fall fall down, you know, fall behind more than one score, one touchdown, it felt like an insurmountable amount of points that the Giants would have to come back from. And I don't know, did you feel the same way? Like in the third quarter, you're like, unless something really drastic changes here, like the Giants are just going to like have a slow bleed to death in this game. Yeah, they lose. The, they obviously lose their kicker and Randy Bullock. He goes down with. I'm getting to say an apparent hamstring injury. Are you for that? The Scottish Hammer though, he comes in. He legs a 40 yard field goal. So you're like, all right, listen, we got that covered. No problem. He almost went out too. So there's some concerns along the way. But in that third quarter, when it goes down to 14 six, as you say, it's like, okay, the third quarter. That's opening drive. So it's what did we what did we figure out in the locker room at halftime offensively? And the answer was not much. And I'm not even putting that on anyone in particular. I'm just, it. you could tell that it was like a little bit of an uphill battle. You mentioned, like, I'm going to even go beyond it being a rookie undrafted free agent quarterback in, in, in Tommy DeVito. It was just, this felt reminiscent. I'm going to talk about on the defensive side too. This just felt reminiscent of games past, right? Where the offensive line play was simply not good enough. I think we're, we're maybe learning a little more why a guy like Justin Pugh was coming off injury and looking for a team to pick him up, right? Like, it was just one of those games where you said the offensive line play is not good enough. The running attack we talked about the week prior, waiting for the home run. Well, when the home run doesn't come, then that makes that look absolutely disastrous. And then, of course, the secondary for the Saints, far more t- talented than what the Giants have seen in recent weeks. And that made it a lot harder for Tommy DeVito, even if he had had the time, to pick out some of those passes. Some really good work by the – I mean, listen, it, this is a bit of the tip of the cap here to the Saints, right? Like, they did a lot of great things defensively that made it really hard for the Giants to have any success. I mean, on the offensive side of the ball, obviously you mentioned no explosive plays. Saquon Barkley, like they were kind of waiting for that home run hit, as you mentioned. It never came. His longest carry was for four yards. He rushed the ball nine times for 14 yards. That's an, If you're, if you're going to run the ball that way, you're never going to win a game. The Giants had 60 yards rushing, and we know that like the Saints – you know, typically have been a really good pass defensive defensive team with their cornerbacks playing exceptionally well. So the Giants looking to exploit the running game, 60 yards, Adam. Like, it, like nothing was going well. You, you mentioned the offensive line. Tommy DeVito was sacked seven times after not being sacked 
at all against Green Bay. And you can, you can, I, I think you pointed out Justin Pugh didn't play well. John Michael Schmitz didn't play well. It yeah. felt like Tommy DeVito was under siege almost the entire game. F- completes 58% of his passes, sacks seven times, no explosive plays. It it felt like they could have played that game three more times and the Giants were going to struggle to score a single touchdown. The one thing I'll say to you uh, before I turn it back over is the Giants didn't have a snap inside the Saints red zone. Yeah, Think about that. Like the, It never felt like they were manufacturing anything. It was like, you know, kickers getting getting running into the kicker and, and pass interference. Like that was the only way the Giants were moving the ball in any capacity, right? Yeah, and I, I find it interesting too because you end up looking at the box score and you've got Tommy DeVito throwing the ball 34 times in this game. You mentioned only nine carries for Saquon Barkley. Tommy DeVito scrambled a couple of design runs, honestly, four for 36 yards. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw this in there as like the little extra hit here. That big hit that everyone was kind of getting up in arms about, it was a clean hit. He hits him with the shoulder. Like it's a timing play. Like it, I'm fine with that not being a problem there on that one as well, even though I think. When games are starting to go sideways, you you look at those plays and you're like, this is it. Like, this is the way we get back in it here. The nine carries for Saquon Barkley. I mean, on the one hand, you look at it and you say, well, he only had 14 yards. So, you know, what are you really waiting for? But out of the two things that you could attack, you would think the rushing defense might be a path to success. If you're evaluating your most talented players, you might say Saquon Barkley is our best weapon that we have. Um, I was disappointed in that regard. I said, you know, I'm not going to put on any one particular facet. but from a offensive play calling standpoint, even coming out of the second half, I'll, I'll say, I really was like, I, there was a disappointment in a lack of, oh, here comes a wrinkle. Whether or not it succeeds or fails, a week ago, it was Wandale Robinson coming out of nowhere and being a real impact player. Mike Kafka, and I'll say Brian Dable as well, right? Offensive side of the football, I, understanding how difficult the defensive front was making it for the Saints, for the Giants to have success. I wouldn't exactly take a step back here and say, wow. They really schemed some opportunities, even if it was for a random chunk play here or there. They did nothing of substantial impact that made me feel like they were trying to find a crack inside the Saints defense. I, I couldn't agree with you more on, on the offensive game planning. They, they, they you know, in the post game press conference, they, they interview Brian Dayball and they ask him like, well, what was going on? What didn't work? He's like, well, nothing worked across the board. And he's didn't like, work. But we found a little something in like the RPO designed runs for Tommy DeVito and like he was able to get some yards. And then you like click into the box score. You're like, okay, he ran the ball four times. So like if if that's the thing that you found, why are we not going back to it more? Like it, it it was really confounding knowing Tommy DeVito had 10 rushes in the game against the Packers where the, the Giants were winning the game. And in this one, they're from behind, and they think that they found something in his designed runs, and he still only run, runs the ball four times. So if to your point, if you know Saquon Barkley isn't hitting the home run and you're getting away from the run game, which is the weakness of the Saints, then you should probably have Tommy DeVito being doing design runs or run a reverse play with Darius Slayton or Wandell Robinson. Right. Like Manufacture right. ways to get yards as opposed to dropping back, having Tommy DeVito try to throw the ball when he's getting pressured on virtually every drop back in this game. It was, yeah, and by the way, uh, seven sacks, I'd say you want to put maybe one of them on Tommy, you know, trying to move around a little bit. For the most part, every single one of those was just like dropping back, watch out, okay, it's over. And unlike a week ago, Green Bay, it seemed like they were kind of controlled collapsing of the pocket where DeVito could just incrementally step up and then choose to use his legs and scramble a little bit. This was really coming from all angles when it came to Tommy DeVito under center there. We're going to get into in just one second the defensive side of the football and yeah we're gonna have to give some respect to one Derek Carr but before we do that I'm gonna tell you about our friends over at Pytential.com. that's because they are visualizing analyzing realizing and actualizing well-being based on uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs Pytential offers users a quick just five minutes in just five minutes online well-being assessment that generates feedback recommendations and in-depth self-improvement exercises to foster personal growth and visualize progress over time the Pytential platform also gives organizational leadership unprecedented insights into well-being at the individual group and population levels and the ability to compare the wellness of the demographic groups they lead and serve. You can go to Pytential.com right now and check out all their great services. That's Pytential, P-I-E-T-E-N-T-I-A-L.com. Now, the other side of this journey, Andy, was the defensive side of the football. And we start actually on the offensive side for the Saints because you and I, listen, we talked about this even in the offseason. The Jets were a big team talking about, oh, should they go with a Derek Carr or they go with Aaron Rodgers? Hey, listen, 
looking back, maybe they maybe they made the wrong the wrong choice there. But a lot of teams were talking about Derek Carr. What is he or isn't he? And what he isn't, at least for me, is a championship quarterback, right? I don't look at him as being the guy that's going to lead you to the promised land if you're a franchise looking to get over that hump. However, when I thought about this after the game, when Derek Carr goes 23 of 28, 218 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, sacked just one time, what I remembered was the New York football Giants defense for as good as they have been recently. They are obviously heavily predicated on getting turnovers. But if you think back to the three-game winning streak, First year starting quarterback in Jordan Love for the Packers. Last second field goal to win that game, but forced some mistakes by him. Patriots, need I say more? Mac Jones, B Bailey Zappi, whoever you want to throw out there. Commander, Sam Howell, good quarterback, young quarterback. First year really getting his legs underneath him here. When you think about the fact that you took on inexperienced quarterbacks, it's really hard to not see that contrast of give this guy a little bit of time. Giants did not get home with their 48% blitz percentage that, that Wink Martindale ran with. And it really makes it easy to start to pick this thing apart somewhat methodically over the course of four quarters. Adam, you, you mentioned the blitz rate. So the, the I, I think the, the easiest way to explain it to anyone is the Giants blitz rate was the fourth most of any team that played this weekend, right? That's right. And their blitz and pressure rate that they got on the quarterback was 10 also fourth best which is which is the lowest in there all of go. the NFL. Yeah. So so you're you're blitzing at an at a, at a top 5 rate and you're getting to the quarterback at the lowest rate possible. And so when you think about that it's like we are trying to send extra bodies at Derek Carr. We aren't getting home, which means there's more one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside and guys like Adore Jackson struggled all day in of in course. coverage against, you know, 6th round AT Perry and, and others. The Giants just couldn't get home outside of one Jason Pinnock sack. It felt like Derek Carr had all the time in the world to sit back there and pick out what play, what receiver, what he wanted to do. He completed 82% of his passes at him. He, he threw for three touchdowns, as you mentioned, had an 87.7 quarterback rating. Like, that is yeah. fantastic. Derek Carr played an awesome game against the Giants, but that's what happens when you don't speed up his process and you allow him to serve the entire field and throw the ball wherever he wants all day long. Yeah, hundred right, 100%. And that's what I mean. A veteran quarterback, if you're going to give him time, he's seen a lot of defenses, right? He's seen a lot of blitz packages. Now, I think there actually was one moment when he called out the wrong, when he identified the wrong Mike linebacker in Micah McFadden as opposed to Bobby Okereke. Neither here nor there. Again, Derek Carr, not a perfect quarterback but he was able to do more than enough in this game. And the funny thing about it too is before we get back to this defense, like then you go look at this box score overall, 16 carries for 66 yards for Camara, eight for 24 for Williams. Okay. 4.1, three yards per carry. You go inside the receiving room. I said, I was concerned about receiving for Alvin Camara, five for 44, Jawan Johnson, who had the touchdown two for 38, right? The long was that 23 yard touchdown pass 36 for Shahid, AT, AT Perry. You mentioned 34 yards. Like, Listen, on the one hand, you could say nobody even torched you. The other way you look at it is everybody got a bite at the apple. It was just I can put the ball where I want to, can spread it around as I need to. And when you're blitzing that much and not getting home, it's going to be a real problem. I I think back to that Green Bay game again. Like if you watch this, this Saints game, those blitzes, it was like taking the long way home every single time, right? Trying to get all the way around the edge and get back to the quarterback. And it's it feels like in a lot of ways that that was kind of the intention. That, yeah, well, Derek Carr is not a real mobile guy, so we'll get there in the end. But what this really exposed to me is, for as much as we like Deontay Banks and believe he's going to grow going forward, we know that Adoree Jackson is, is closer to the end than the beginning of his career. Uh, Cordell Flott still learning a lot. And then even on the back end, we know that Xavier McKinney and Bobby O'Karake, to mention the linebacker as well, they played every single snap this season for the New York Football Giants. But is that really good enough, right? There's still a lot that this team needs, especially right there in the trenches. That defensive front, uh, really on both sides of the ball for the Giants, when it was the defense for the Saints, they were meeting the ball carriers two yards behind the line of scrimmage, uh, being over, you know, over, over dramatic for effect. On offense, it was the same thing, though. It was like, okay, you now you go ahead and take the first free yard, Saints, and then we'll see if we can get you there. The running game has always been a problem for the Giants this season. Sometimes you don't see it in certain games based on game script, but again, it was like need a little chunk, get a little chunk. That's what it felt like all game long for the Giants. Well, and to me, we talked about this a little bit um, pre-show, Adam, but the 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 issue is the turnovers, right? The Giants had had have had historic amounts of turnovers in the last four weeks. 
the most the most in in a four week span of almost any team in the last ten years. So the Giants right. have been very fortunate in forcing turnovers on the defensive side of the ball. When that doesn't happen, and you're trying to pressure and manipulate all of this urgency with Derek Carr, no turnovers happen. Not only does it mean that there's going to be sustained possessions for the Saints, it also means you're not turning the field over for the offense that at at its best is is maybe mediocre when it comes yeah. to the talent that they have on, on, on there and the ability for Tommy DeVito to get the ball. So, Adam, you're, you're letting the other team just march the ball down the field. You're not flipping the field at all for your offense. We know, like, they forced a bunch of turnovers against the Packers, and the offense still needed a one-minute, last-minute, last-second field goal to win the game. No, no turnovers on defense means the defense is on the field so much longer and the offense just really can't get any cheap points. Uh, and on top of which, too, as you say, with, with that being the case, it's 24 points for the Saints. If they needed it to be 31, it could have been 31, right? Like I'm mentioning yeah. stats here as if the, the Saints needed to accomplish something from basically the mid of the third quarter on, right? They knew. You knew very quickly, as you said. Well, that next touchdown, when it was 14-6, you thought, okay, not even score on this drive. Just show me that you can move this football. Couldn't do that. And it was like, okay, here we go. And by the way, I ride this thing all the way to the bottom. I don't leave. I sit there and I keep watching it and I keep waiting for something to happen. And also on the defensive side, when we talk about turnovers. I, you go back and you think about these other quarterbacks and these other games and you say, well, it's interesting, right? Like, were they, were they making the mistakes or were we forcing mistakes? And I think again, veteran quarterback is going to sit there and say, don't make the bad play. He took, he took an intentional grounding on one play, Derek Carr, and that was the right play. Like, just don't put it in a spot where the Giants could get an interception. Go ahead and take the loss down and live to do it again in another series. And that was a big difference. You, a nail on the head in terms of 12 turnovers over the last three games, four games. You got, when you get none, you can see how much it is on an even playing field where the Giants lack. I, you know, you mentioned it at the beginning, and, and this is maybe just a small footnote in the game because I don't think it, it, it would have changed the game decisively, but – Having Randy Bullock go out early after kicking a field goal and then pulling his hamstring on on the kickoff, and then having you know Jamie Gillen come in and try to kick field goals, they had his hamstring wrapped up, multiple tape jobs, just trying to trying to get any uh, manufacture any kind of kicking game possible. Adam, the last three drives for the Saints started at the 32, 30, and forty three yard line, and I yeah. know that this is going to be a small footnote in the game, but like. You know, you're giving them a short field where your defense isn't forcing turnovers. All they need is 20, 25 yards to be able to get into field goal range. It felt like the, the defense was kind of put behind the eight ball, knowing that their offense couldn't score a touchdown, couldn't get in the red zone. And the special teams was basically handing the ball to Derek Carr at the 35, 40 yard line and saying, here you go. You only have 20 yards of field to protect before they're in scoring range anyway. And there is something to that, right? Like if you're the Saints, there's something to the idea of being like, okay, well, really, we just need to stop them by our 40 or our 35, our 30 maybe, right? Like what is the, what's the line of delineation where you say we can keep giving this ground. And then when the Giants feel like they're forced to go for it because they don't have the kicking game, immediately that field position completely flips and you go, oh, now we're also giving a short field to a team that we haven't been able to get pressure on, haven't been able to force turnovers on and seem to be able to move the ball pretty methodically. So it was, listen, this was an all points front. And in that sense, it did to me tie a bow on the season in a lot of ways. We have three more weeks to go, and we'll still learn a lot of things about individual players. But everything that we said in this game, kind of regardless of Tommy DeVito being the quarterback, um, feels indicative of, of where the weaknesses are on this roster, right? Offensive line play, yes, it's had some good games. It's mostly been bad. Defensively, yes, they were able to, they, they had this great run of a handful of games. But remember, there were early games during the season where it felt like the Giants couldn't stop anybody, couldn't stop the better quarterbacks, could not find a way to force a turnover to get a key stop in a critical moment. And we always find ourselves the last couple of years talking about, well, is it because the offense, you know, doesn't have sustained drives and the defense has to be out there too long? Is it because of that? Like you always want to point to something else that's impacting the other area. For me coming out of this game, it was this team still has a long way to go. It needs help on the offensive line. We knew that it needs help on the defensive front. It needs help in the secondary. It needs help. It needs help in the weapons category. And we know that you don't have Daniel Jones right now, even if he had a bad season, no matter by which met metric you use. The bottom line is I think this team is further from what we thought coming out of last year and the wild card appearance and beating the Vikings than they are to 
maybe being a top 10 draft pick, right? Like I, I, there's somewhere in the middle ground there and maybe health and a couple of key acquisitions makes the difference here. The giants will have money to spend, but, but that I think to me, I think that that was the reality. I kind of came out of yesterday's game with is yeah. Yeah. Last year was probably a little more juice than we really deserve to squeeze. Right? Like, is that, does that make sense to you? It, it it does. The the breaks went the Giants' way, and they make the playoffs, and they win a playoff game, and they played well in that playoff game, right? That's right. that's the reality. So so all the breaks went their way. They win a playoff game. Everyone had you know the vibes were you know immaculate. They all were super vibes. high, right? Just just playing on vibes. This year they lose that Jets game when they have a ninety nine percent chance to win. They lose the Buffalo game on the goal line, and then they you know like those are two games that could have you know tipped the scales either way that didn't go their way this year. But yes, the last three games, the Giants have played two at home against terrible football teams in the Patriots, as well as going on the road to Washington, who doesn't look to be a great team. And so it kind of, you know, felt like a little bit of a mirage that that all, all of this happened, Adam. I, I, you know, Tommy DeVito playing well, winning three games. You know, we, we talked about it before. They're like, should he be the starter coming into next year? Like, there's all these question marks. Like, I think we should just enjoy the games for what they are knowing that this team is further away than, than we had hoped we're rooting for this team and we like the players but across the board the Giants you know th this is one aberration for the defense I think of all of the you know different facets facets of this team the defense has been the best piece of yeah. things for the Giants but it's still not good enough when you're not forcing turnovers the other team's winning time of possession and you're not giving your, your offense a chance so it, it is tough it is horrible. Uh, I will say that that loss that loss made it feel like it was going to be impossible to win against the Eagles twice oh, well, and win against the right. Rams, right? Like that's the other thing cuz technically like, like if you think about it. Yeah. No, yeah, no, cuz te technically, technically be like the Giants there's... Oh no. Oh no. Dan no, oh, this is bad. Andy and I are so emotional. We can't we can't let Julie go. Go ahead. Finish. Finish. I was going to say, like, you know, emotionally, if the Giants find a way to win against the Saints, you can talk yourself into, like, all right, we got to win out. I know it's against playoff teams that are playing really good. Like, the Rams are playing really good football right now. But you can kind right. of, like, do the mental gymnastics to get yourself there. Adam, By the way, and uh, the and Giants are Vito. still alive. They yeah. are still, they are still yeah. technically alive, right? They are. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying any untruths right now. As much oh, as much as okay. pain we're gonna go ahead. Here. We're gonna go ahead and move past this. Technically, the Giants are still alive here for Andrew because we know he's a, he's a dreamer. And by the way, though, on that point, here's what should be really depressing for Giants fans coming out of this game because on Sunday or even over the I'll say the entire weekend because I think there was one game that we ended up getting on. Well, Detroit, yeah. So Detroit ended up winning on their Saturday matchup, and that's all well and good. It didn't really matter so much as far as the scheme of things, what the Giants needed to happen on Sunday. The Cleveland Browns beat. The Chicago Bears, that mattered to keep them out of your way. The Green Bay Packers, they lost the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That mattered to keep them out of the Giants' way, or to keep them closer to them, I should say. The Carolina Panthers, yes, the Carolina Panthers beat the Atlanta Falcons 9-7 to to help you out there. The Washington uh, Commanders did not do you any favors, tried to come back against the Rams. That's okay, though. That wasn't the most important. You're going to have that head-to-head -head against them. Everything, all of the most critical, I'll put it that way, the most critical pieces of the schedule went the way that the Giants needed it to, and that's what was most debilitating about it, is the Giants were like, hey, you hold the fate in your hands. And they were like, buddy, this is like an egg race on a spoon, and I got to tell you, this thing could not be any flatter in my hand. Like It was just immediately drop the egg, ruin your chances. And in, and in a process, by the way, some things got figured out this weekend from a playoff perspective. The 49ers, Eagles, and Cowboys are all clinched, right? They're all in there. Now, how that's going to shake out from an order, we'll wait and see. We also have now in the hunt, it goes Lions, Bucks, Vikings with the Rams there sitting there trying to keep it in. Seven and seven now becomes the new gold standard, and the Giants with that loss, still with the Saints have had ahead of them. The Seattle Seahawks are waiting to play tonight, but it really, man, it really just went from like, Hey, it's low, but there's an opportunity if the weekend breaks right. And it was like, everything is going, oh, no, except for us. Except for what we need to do. We couldn't handle our business. Yeah, the, the, the simple answer in all this is, and, and Adam loves when, when we talk about the simulator and, and, and where things stand. If the Giants were to win their three games coming. Oh, know, no, I'm sorry. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, beep, 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 beep. 
we can talk about that on Tuesday or Wednesday or another day. I'm not doing the th- win the three game scenario here and what the percentage is. Oh, well, no, no, no. Well, well listen, I- I'm going to give it to you just, just for contextual purposes. The Giants are not going to win their next three games. Let's just be okay. very clear about that. All right, that. that's good. But good start. If, the, if the Giants were to win their three games, the reason why this game was so important against the Saints was the Giants still only have a 40% chance to make the playoffs. So, like, even if they win out, they don't have the likelihood of them going to the playoffs is still less than it than it is for them well, to miss. So, like in the crazy stratosphere of the Giants miraculously backing into three wins, they still don't control their own fate. It is still highly unlikely that they would even make the playoffs anyway. That's why this this loss was so debilitating for for anyone that still had playoff aspirations. And that was the idea of beating the Saints because to just to your point, eight and nine, I kept saying eight and nine is the that's the reasonable path to get to the playoffs because you can't think the Giants are going to run the table. But it was eight and nine beating the Saints, beating the Rams and then getting a throwaway game from the Eagles. Once you lose the game, the Saints, you go, well, come on now. And the Eagles also have something to play for now as well. Like they have the Cowboys nipping at their heels, their Cowboys lose. So now all of a sudden the hierarchy of the NFC East the playoff seeding, all those things come back into play. There's a world now where after this loss and looking at the last three games, the Eagles need both of those games against the Giants. And they come out with a real desire to get a couple of wins. And then the Rams as well. They get a win that you kind of expected them to get against the commanders a little bit closer in the end than they wanted it to be. But they're a team that's 500. And they have, again, very much controlling their own fate in terms of the playoff picture. So bottom line is the Giants are effectively removed from this operation. And the one last note, is also on the draft order and just this this very weird scenario that the Giants were living in. It's very rare that you can go from being a team that in one weekend, as could have been the case this weekend, the Giants would have been picking 19th in the NFL draft, the last possible wild card team that they would have been sitting in there at the seventh seed. Instead, the Giants find them sitting themselves sitting at seventh. Now, Chicago at five and nine at five, and then the Jets are right ahead of them. Unfortunately, I guess it's strength of schedule that they go to first here. Something has to be up because the Giants lost head to head to the Jets, and yet they still remain ahead of the Giants. It is fascinating now because now the last three weeks of the season, and I will be getting kept on this in terms of you are in the top 10 now. There is a hierarchy of teams that need or do not need quarterbacks. And the Giants, again, in one loss, and I think it's the right way to do it, Up until they had that loss, you keep saying there's a real chance. Don't worry about where they are. Now, all of a sudden, they are one of one, two, three, four, five, five and nine teams. And they have three more teams in Tennessee, Atlanta, and Green Bay that are all, sorry, Atlanta, Green Bay, and Las Vegas that are all six and eight. Like this Muck and Meyer is right there. And the only, the only difference here is that Washington doesn't look like they're going to actually win any games down the stretch and they're going to keep themselves ahead of them. It's, it's going to be a fascinating three weeks from that standpoint as well. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're thinking about the draft order for the Giants, it, they obviously can't get as high as the number one pick because those teams are just bad and they have way more losses on their on the docket than the Giants do. Oh yeah. So realistically, you think about what's the range the Giants are going to be in when it, when you talk about it. I mean, the Washington Commanders don't look like they're going to win another game. So like, can the Giants even get into the top four? I don't. I don't think they can, even with three straight losses. So like. I don't know if you agree with me, but I think realistically the Giants are going to be picking somewhere between 5 and 12, and these games are going to be critical to figuring out exactly where they fall into that range. Yeah, 100%. The only team I would look at because of because of who they brought back and where they are. Now, they lost 45 to 29. The Arizona Cardinals because they have Kyler Murray back, but they're going but I, I say oh that's the one chance over 3 games maybe they could win a couple. But they play the Bears, who are playing some good football right now and trying to be competitive, then the Eagles, and then Seattle. So what happens in those last few games as far as Seattle maybe, and if they beat the Eagles or not, and if they're out of it, right? But like, it's hard to look at one of the few teams that you'd say, well, they, you know, they have a quarterback now. They could win some ball games. New England's not going out and winning, winning, you know, winning three games right now against because the Giants obviously have that record head-to-head against them as well. So I assume that five is probably as high as the Giants can go. But by the way, we'll get into this over the next three weeks. I also assume that the Giants are going to win one more football game this year. And fans are probably going to be disgusted by that, whether it's because it's a throwaway or whether it's because this team showed this fight, something that we'll talk about in our next episode. What did this team prove over this stretch from a Brian Dable head coach and what the future of this team looks like. Because without some of these wins that fans were disgusted by, 
you'd be talking about hiring a new head coach and you'd be talking about maybe getting rid of your GM. So there were things that were accomplished here, even if the season is effectively over. At the end of the day, yeah. Adam, yeah. The, there's three games left in the season. It feels like a lost season. While mathematically still alive, it does feel like this was the end of any playoff aspirations the Giants had. Yeah. So going into these games against the Eagles, going into the Christmas time, you have to think, do you want the Giants to win a game? If you do or don't, what do you actually want to see on the field? What can happen over the next three weeks that will be encouraging for Giants fans? Because we know as every win that they have may drop them down in the draft order, but you still want players to look good or progress or to understand who's part of the long-term solution. Buddy, when we come back in our next episode, I'm going to make some, we'll make to talk about what do we want to see. And also some bold statements about things that I think I know about next year and key players currently on this roster. It's going to be a lot of fun. The games may not matter as much as we thought they would over the last three weeks, but plenty. And I do mean plenty to talk about as we move forward. You get us over on YouTube at One Giant Podcast, on Twitter at AndyMac214, at Adam Arbrecht, at One Giant Podcast, and on the podcast feed. Until next time, for better or worse, as Andrew Mackowitz would want, need, nay, somberly to many people know. As always, let's go Big Blue. Oh, <laughs>